We teach them. We have lessons planned that they uh, uh, have. They print them out, and they go over these lessons with your kids. So when you're in the car going back home with them, ask them questions. Amen? Uh, we make them memorize the whole New Testament. Um, and so uh, by the time they're in your car, they're going to be preaching to you. Amen? And so that's how we train. We tend to preach to you when you get home. And so we believe that this is the age where you have to mark kids. This is the age. Amen. For those of you who grew up in church, yeah, I remember Sunday school back in the day, right? And if you had a good Sunday school teacher, you remember that Sunday school teacher. They poured into kids. They taught them the Bible. And so if you start them out early, there's a good chance when they get older, they're going to stick to that. Amen. So you got to start them off early. Amen. And st- talking about kids, we had our youth second youth night on Friday. Amen, with the youth. And this Friday, make sure you drop off your youth. Drop them off. I'm telling you, drop them off and go on a date night if you can. Amen. Just put your, they, I know some of them don't want to go push them out the car. We'll be there with our security. We'll grab them and throw them inside that room. Amen. Don't worry. No harm will be done. What's the worst that can happen? Look at me. Amen. I got a little twitch, but, you know, I'm okay. Amen. Well, they made us go to church. Amen. And so uh, we are a good result of what happens when you allow youth to be exposed. Because when the Holy Ghost get a hold of them, you just never know. I'm telling you, they'll come back home. You'll be like, what happened to you? Amen. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. We continue with our sermon series, A Matter of the Heart. Uh, A Matter of the Heart. And... You know, as the new year uh, began, we, we began to explore uh, the idea or the goal, if you will, of growing and being a healthy church. We, we spoke to the, uh, on Vision Night that we don't want to focus on numerical growth. We want to focus on being a healthy church, spiritually, um, physically, financially, uh, ma- family-wise, we want to focus on being and growing as a healthy church. And so we're very intentional with everything we do as a church. If we don't grow numerically by the end of the year uh, by two or three people, that's okay because what we want to focus on this year is healthy growth. How is your heart? Where are you in your walk with Jesus? Because what good is it that we grow to be a thousand, two thousand membership church, but people are not walking with Jesus? And so we make the mistake of confusing a mega church, if you will, a church with a lot of people as, wow, that church God must be doing something amazing in that church. And to a certain extent, God is. But the real question is not how many people are in a church, but how many of those people are actually having a walk with Jesus. So as a pastor, that is my concern. That is my responsibility. Because at the end of the day, when I stand before God, it's me, not you, that has to give an account to Jesus. Does that make sense? So I have to do everything I can to make sure, starting now as a baby church, that we focus on metrics, if you will, on how to measure where people are in their walk with Jesus. And of course, uh, I can't do that on my own. That's why we've installed and anointed uh, three other pastors that will come alongside, help me, Uh, to do this. And as the church continues to grow numerically, we will continue to add more pastors to shepherd the sheep because one person obviously cannot do it. And so uh, that's what we're focusing on, the idea of growing and being a healthy church as individuals and collectively as a church. So we're on this new sermon series called A Matter of the Heart. And last week, we explored the battle for the heart. The battle for the heart. And we learned that there is a real enemy battling for your heart. 
And when we say heart, we don't mean a literal heart. We're talking about the soul. Your soul, the real you. Not, this is not the real you. This is staying behind. But we have a soul which the enemy, and we identified last Sunday, that there is a real enemy that's battling for your heart, for your soul. He's battling for your spouse. He's battling for your children, believe it or not. We live in the most crazy generation out of any generation, hands down. We have more temptations in this generation than we've ever had in any generation. Back in the Bible days, they didn't have no TV, no social media, no electronics, nothing. Even leading up to, uh, uh, going back, you can go back to the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Today, we have more access to so much temptation. Let me put it to you this way. If your child is in elementary school and they have access to a computer or a phone and you haven't put a system of app to block anything inappropriate, chances are your child has already been exposed to pornography. Easily. They're already exposed. Their brain has already been damaged. Easily. That's the generation we're living in. This is where the enemy is coming through. He's coming after you. He's coming after your spouse, after your marriage. He's coming after your children. And we explained that last week. He's coming for your heart. And we identified in 1 Peter 5.8 from the New Living Translation. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. John 10.10 from the voice translation. The thief approaches with malicious intent, looking to steal, slaughter, and destroy. I came, Jesus, to give life with joy and abundance. Ephesians 6.11, New Living Translation. Put on all. Everybody say all. All. Oh, say it again like you mean it. Say all. all. And that's where we fail. Put on all of God's armor. Some of y'all have some of the armor. And you're losing a battle in a certain area and you're wondering why. It tells you right there. You don't have all the armor. You're good in one area. You got one area covered, but there's an area that you left open. And let me tell you, you give the devil an inch, he'll take a ruler. Put on all, the, all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against, again, all. The Bible is very strategic. When the Holy Spirit inspires a writer, it's very strategic. Every single letter in a Bible text matters. All twice. Put on all of God's armor. Why? He, then he explains the why right there. Stand firm against all strategies. Meaning the devil doesn't have one strategy. He has many strategies to come after you. And if the devil was able to persuade one third of holy powerful angels to come with him when he was kicked out of heaven... What makes you think he can't persuade you? You ain't no angel. Just giving you perspective. Therefore, the Holy Spirit warns us, put on all the armor so that you can fight against all the strategies of the devil. And so this week, we begin part two by examining the need for transformation of the heart. A transformation of the heart. So we talked about the battle for your heart. Now, we want to explore the transformation of the heart. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, New Living Translation, guard your heart above, there it goes again, all else. (laughs) Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Now, in a few uh, seconds or a minute, we're going to read Joe chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. But before we go there, let me give you some backdrop, some context. In the book of Joe, Joe is what we call a minor prophet. You got the major prophets, the minor prophets. You go, well, pastor, why minor, why major? Uh, it really doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Minor prophets simply mean, there's five minor prophets, simply means that uh, they wrote shorter books uh, than the major prophets. The major prophets wrote... They, they, they wrote, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write 
longer chapters of books. The minor prophets, just very little pages. And that's the difference between a minor prophet and a major prophet. But they both were prophets, and a prophet basically is a person who speaks on behalf of God. In those days, they were consecrated, separated to speak only what God told them to speak to the people of Israel and to kings. And when God called a prophet, they were never excited about it. Because it's not like today, everybody, everybody's a prophet. You ever see people's Facebook profiles? Careful. If you get a request from prophet so-and-so and apostle so-and-so, you better examine whether you approve or not because everybody's giving themselves this title. Listen, back in the Bible days, it wasn't like that. When God called the woman that was pregnant, I'm going to consecrate that child as my prophet, that woman was like, oof, okay, because it meant that prophet's going to die for me. It means that prophet's going to go to kings and tell kings, thou saves the Lord, and the king had every right to kill them. That's what a prophet represented in the Bible. Anybody want to be a prophet? Okay. I'm ready to consecrate you. So I, want, I say that so that you can understand and have perspective and a greater appreciation for what a prophet is and was in the Bible. And so Job, um, he, in the, he began to, to write to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was in dire need of serious change at the time that Job is writing uh, this book. The writer is seeking to motivate the people towards repentance by proclaiming that the day of the Lord is near as evidenced by the coming invasion. Now, Joe speaks of the invasion of locusts in which the locusts could be a metaphor referring to an invading army. But Joe realizes that the nation is on a collision course with disaster unless they have a transformation of the heart. So when one examines their own life, we come to the realization that we need to make some changes in our lives. Now, if everything was perfect, there would be no need to change because everything is running smooth. But when things are going crazy, things are not working out, you see there's a doomsday approaching, which it is. We have to ask ourselves, am I right? Am I doing according to what God is expecting of me to do. Now, last week we examined the battle for the heart and the need to have eyes that were open to see the need for change. This week, we dig a little deeper to see that in order to change, a transformation of the heart is required. You cannot, you cannot move on in everything that God designed for you, unless there's a transformation of your heart. There are no ifs or buts about it. There is a transformation of the heart that has to take place. If you're going to see the blessings of God and his promises come to fruition in your life, in your marriage, in your children, in your finances, there's a way that he designed it and he expects us who call him Lord, Savior and Lord. He expects us to study it, to read it, but more importantly, to apply it. And when we apply it, we see the effects of what he expects of us. So without a transformed heart, one will continue to long for the actions and attitudes which plague them and which drag them down. Now, change is scary. Change is scary. There's a lot of people who don't like change. I'm a type of person, I like things the way they are. You know, like, I, I, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But, but, but God sometimes don't, it just doesn't work the way you think. God is God. And God does things that the human mind simply does not understand. From Old Testament to New Testament, God did things so different with everyone that you read these things and you're like, this can't be real. This is amazing. Like, there's so much comedy in here. Anybody ever read the Bible and just start laughing? I'm the only one. Thank you. 
That's my comedic mind. I, I'm studying the Bible, and I just crack up because there's some funny stuff in here. Like, I try to put myself in the shoes of a lot of these people, and I'm saying, man, what would I have done? And it's just crazy stuff, the way God works in the life of people. So today, we're going to examine three actions and attitudes. Which one needs to possess in order to be able to allow God to work in our heart transformation? So look with me, Job chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. If you have your Bible app, if you have a regular Bible, and if you don't have a Bible, simply look at the screens and read along with me. Job 2, verses 12 to 13. That is why the Lord says, turn to me now. While there is time, give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I ask you to bring conviction to every individual. Father, I ask that when we leave this room, we leave asking ourselves, what is it that I need to change in my life? Father, ultimately, your goal is for us to have an intimate relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Father, so I pray that you will speak to us that we not only become hearers of this word, but become doers. For it is in the doing where we see true transformation of the heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, for a transformation of the heart to materialize, write this down, number one. Turn to the Lord with all your heart. Turn to the Lord with all your heart. That's number one. If one is going to have any hope of a successful transformation in life, one must turn to the Lord with all their heart. In the context of this passage, the nation of Israel uh, had apparently turned away from the Lord and they were about to pay a serious price for doing so. See, we need to understand that when God's judgment is involved, it is not simply about punishing the bad people. It's about waking them up to the need for change. Anytime the Holy Spirit brings conviction, anytime the Holy Spirit exposes sin, it's not to shame you, it's not to embarrass you, it's simply to, make, to wake up the conscience so that you can turn back to God. It's simply God showing you mercy. It's simply God telling, look, I love you so much, I need to expose this because I've been warning you for quite some time, but you're not listening to me in private. So I'm going to have to do something a little radical to expose the sin that's hiding in your heart so that you can realize that you got to turn from your wicked ways before it's too late. That's the kind of God we serve. He's a loving God a merciful God, a compassionate type of God. So we need to understand that uh, God's judgment is real. See, any parent who looks, at a, who looks at discipline as simply punishment may win the battle, but they will eventually lose the war. We don't punish our kids just to punish. We want them to turn from their ways. We want them to understand what they're doing is wrong, why it's wrong. And eventually we want them to come to their senses and start doing what is right for the right reasons. When we do anything half-heartedly, what is the usual result? We do what we do with no passion. And when we do something with half a heart and truth, we are actually doing it with no heart. God wants you to serve him wholeheartedly. He wants you to be all in. Not halfway in, all in. You see, we see this all the time in the workplace. You ever, anybody have a coworker? You see them dragging along? Every time you walk through the break room, they're in there. <laughs> right? We all have that, 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 that one coworker, always in the restroom, like, oh, where were you? Oh, man. I had it bad today. Dude, that's what you said yesterday. 
What you got in your stomach? A dead body in there? <laughs> Half-hearted. They just, that's just the way they are. If you have ever done anything half-heartedly, you know what I'm talking about. You're doing it, but you're really not doing it. You're doing it physically, but your heart is not into it. And some of us are serving God that way. Like, we're doing it, eh, so they won't have to say nothing. Eh, that's the pastor. Okay, let me get real next to the pastor. You can see me. <laughs> hey, good morning, pastor. <laughs> there he saw me. <laughs> Half-heartedly. I'm going to remind y'all right now, anything you do, you do for God. Because I'm going to tell you right now, me, Pastor Ariel, oh, I'm going to disappoint you. Can I be real transparent? I'm going to disappoint you. I'm telling you this right now. So if you're finding that perfect pastor, you're in the wrong church, you better go right now. Down the block is where you're going to find that perfect pastor. You can't depend on men. You can't look. You can't put pastors in a pedestal. They're humans. They're going to disappoint you. But when you serve God wholeheartedly, ooh, you could take that to the bank. You will never ever be disappointed. When you do things for God wholeheartedly, you will never be disappointed. He always comes through. He always surprises you. When you least expect it, he will bless you. Beyond your imagination. That's the kind of God he is. See, when one doesn't give their, their all, all what they're doing, it, it just really, when, when you do things half hardly, all it really does is sucks the life out of you. It really does. Because you're doing it with the wrong intentions, wrong motives. Anytime you do something with the wrong motives, you're never going to get the satisfaction. But when you serve God with the right motives, not what you can get out of God, but what you can give to God. When you come with that attitude and that mindset, God, if you don't do anything else for me, I'm okay with that. I'm here because I need you. I'm here because I cannot go another day without you. I'm here because had it not been for your mercy, I would not be here right now. So God, if there's anything that you don't do much for me, I'm okay with that. Because the fact that your son Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago and shed the blood when I simply did not deserve it. The fact that you thought about me when I was not even thinking about you. Uh, the fact that you show up over and 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 over again uh, gives me reason and motivation uh, to be here on a Sunday morning to do everything I can uh, so that I can worship you. Uh, the fact that we come in here in the morning and we put up these curtains and and we set up this sound system and we set up these benches it is my worship unto God I'm setting it up and I'm worshiping you I'm putting this together and I'm worshiping you we're putting cables together and I'm worshiping you my friends it is all worship unto God when you see it that way, you get satisfaction. When you come with a mindset, I'm not here to serve past. I'm not here to serve nobody. I'm here because I'm worshiping God. I'm making the cafe bustelo and I'm worshiping. And when people drink that coffee, they're going to sense the, the presence of God because I did it with all my heart. If the coffee ain't good, that means you already know. <laughs> Half-heartedly. <laughs> Who made a coffee today? <laughs> See, God takes what is happening with people seriously. He takes it personal. 
What happens to you, God takes personal. Notice through the prophet Joel, the Lord says, turn to me. See, God desires a right relationship with his people. Later, this is the reason he sends Jesus to die for our sins. Here is the issue with, we all deal with at one time or another in life. We think we are all heading in the right direction when in truth, we need to honestly turn back toward God. Wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. The word translated return in the Hebrew means turn back or to repent. Repent literally means to change your mind. Change the way you're thinking about the current situation. Change your mind. That's what it means. See, the implication is that one will turn their backs on the old direction they were traveling to and head into the new direction. For one to be able to repent, they must have a change of will. Repentance is not about being sorry you got caught. Repentance is not about being sorry that you got caught, no, or sorry that things went wrong, but rather it involves a change of the will. The change of will encourages us to focus on the right path. The change of will gives one the strength to carry on in the midst of difficult temptations. See, Joel wanted to punctuate the point he is making by sharing with the people their need for public actions that reflect their inward change of heart. He speaks of fasting, weeping, as well as mourning. These things were done in the Old Testament when a person was seeking forgiveness and direction from God. Fasting would be giving up food in light of seeking God's direction or forgiveness. The weeping is not dropping empty crocodile tears. That's not the weeping it's talking about here. But rather real tears of both repentance and joy. So if one is going to be able to have a transformation of the heart, one needs to turn to God wholeheartedly. Next, let's examine verse 13. Joel chapter 2 verse 13. This is from the Holman Christian Standard Bible Version. It says, tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. So number one, for a transformation of the heart to materialize, number one, turn to the Lord with all your heart. Number two, write this down. Tear one's heart out and return to the Lord. Tear one's heart out and return to the Lord. Now, when you read this, this seems a little extreme, right? Joe is telling the people not only do they need to turn toward God, but they also need to tear out their hearts. Ouch. Now, you got to be careful when you're reading the Bible. Some things you don't take literal. Pastor, I'm ready. Here's the knife. <laughs> do what you got to do, Pastor. We got to be real careful. Some things in the Bible are literal. Some things are spiritual. Here, obviously, it is spiritual. Spiritual. See, when he tells them to tear out their heart, not just their clothes, Joe is digging at the heart of what had been ailing them. See, symbolism over substance. Ritual over true repentance. See, the tearing of one's clothes was done in the cases of extreme anguish and grief over some calamity or misfortune. It was an outward sign of what was supposed to reflect the pain found in one's heart. You see, the process of true repentance involves a broken heart. Being sorry to save one's skin will not lead to repentance. Look at the writer, Paul. Paul writes, Inspired by the Holy Spirit to the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 10. New Living Translation. Watch this. Now, I am glad I sent it. Not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants 
us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. <laughs> so let me give you a context. Paul, he's writing to them. He sent them a letter. Because the Corinthians, they were all over the place. So he wrote them a letter. And he's telling them, basically, real. it was a tough, tough love letter. Like, y'all wrong. Y'all need to change. And if you don't change, this is what happens. And so now he's writing this letter telling them, hey, listen, I'm glad I sent it. And I'm, the reason I'm glad I sent it is because you repented. You found it in your heart that you were wrong and you repented and you changed your ways. So I'm glad that I sent that letter in the first place. You see, someone who really loves you will tell you the truth. Someone who really loves you and, look and wants the best for you will take you aside in private and say, hey, man, I've been noticing some behaviors, man. And I just got to tell you, because I love you, if you don't change, I don't know what's causing these behaviors, but you need to change. Because you're going to affect everything or everyone connected to you. You see, real honesty, real honesty doesn't ruin a friendship. It exposes if you really had one. And so if you're my friend and you tell me the truth in private with love and wisdom and I stop talking to you, then you know I wasn't really your friend. Right. See, Joel not only wants the people to turn to the Lord in verse 12, but he wants them to return to the Lord. See, the return was not to the empty rituals of the past. No, 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 no. Empty rituals dead in the heart of the worshiper. It leads them into a false sense of security. External religion does not penetrate to the depth of the heart and soul is worthless. God wants true repentance. He wants for you to turn to him with everything and never look back again. The Lord was not looking for people to be externally religious, but rather he seeks the hearts of people. God wants your heart. Because if he has your heart, he has everything. Because the heart is the center of all your emotions. He wants to sit at the center. The psalmist writes, uh, King David, he writes in Psalm 51, 17, look at this. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repented heart, oh God. Come on now. If you come with a broken heart, a repented heart, God sees you. He don't even wait for you to come. And he'll run out to you. He'll pick you up, turn you around, and put you on solid ground. Simply because he sees a true repented heart. One thing they either do desire to do or will do eventually. See, it's all about the heart for God. The heart is both thoughts and action. Maybe you might be thinking, but why should I return to God? He's going to shame me. He's going to make me feel guilty. That's, that's what the devil tells you. That's what the devil puts in your mind. You go to God now, man. You've done so much wrong. He is not going to accept you. You're going to feel guilty. You, nope. Uh -uh. You're going to have to do this, this, this. There's nothing you got to do but say, God, I'm repentant and mean it. Let's look at verse 13 one more time. Joel 2.13. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. Oh, man. How good is that? So for our transformation of the heart to materialize, number one, turn to the Lord with all your heart. Number two, tear one's heart out and return to the Lord. And number three, write this down. Grasp the true character of the Lord. Grasp the true character of the Lord. See, the last part of verse 13 explains why one can turn to and return to the Lord. 
I want to remind somebody here this morning. Jesus loves you just as you are. I'm going to say that again. Jesus loves you just as you are. But he loves you way too much to leave you as you are. You best believe he's going to take you just as you are, but he's going to empower you with the Holy Spirit when you come to him with a repentant heart and the Holy Spirit is going to start working in your life. So when people come around you and say, man, something different about you, you say, oh, this ain't nothing yet. I'm under construction, baby girl. Wait until the Holy Spirit gets true to a hold of me. I'm going to be somebody you don't even recognize because when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, let me tell you, there is a whole construction going on in your heart. He loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. You see, he is not a God who wants to rub your face in your failure. Mm -mm, uh -uh. Now, see, we saw that displayed with Peter. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, yet when he returned to Jesus, the Lord, instead of the Lord telling him, I told you so, I told you you were going to deny me three times, mm, you think Jesus rubbed it in his face? Nah, 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 nah. He ain't that kind of Jesus. No, 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 no. You see, what Jesus did is he's not, he, he, he didn't make an example of Peter. He didn't say, I told you so. No. See, Joe states the Lord is gracious. A gracious person does not rub your face into your defeat they give you a way out so that you can save face come on that's the kind of God that we serve the Lord is compassionate compassion is in part is the ability to sympathize with another person because you can relate to them so instead of laughing at their failure, you feel a deep sadness for them and that you should motivate you to help them out. So when you are filled with God's mercy, you're filled with God's Holy Spirit. You don't laugh at people's failure. You don't make fun of them. You don't even wish them bad. You're looking at them and if you see them fall, you go right up to where they're at. You give them a hand up and you say, it's okay. You're going to make it, my brother. We in this together. I feel your pain. I've been there before and I'm telling you God is going to make it work for you if you need anything I'm right here right now as a matter of fact I don't care that we're in the middle aisle 13 in Walmart hold my hand I'm going to pray with you right here in the middle of Walmart and the Holy Ghost is going to fill this supermarket right now in the name of Jesus that's what the devil don't want you to do he don't want you to pray in Walmart but we're going to be that kind of church that we're going to pray in Walmart. We'll pray in Target. We'll pray in the tire shop. It don't matter. Begin to pray for the person right there and then. He's compassionate. The Lord is slow to anger. This is important to know because this implies that God is not some hothead who blows up over the slightest provocation. He's not like us. Any little thing, we want to blow up and smack somebody. Because God ain't done with y'all, right? Some of y'all still got that ghettoness in you. Some of y'all talking about, yeah, I'm saved, but I'm from the south side saved. Still got a little hood in me. I done told you God is still working. He ain't done. That's our excuse, right? We try to spiritualize everything. It's all right. It's all right. I ain't judging. I ain't judging. I ain't judging. Why doesn't God simply wipe out all the bad in the world? You ever got that question? Why doesn't God just wipe out everything in the world? Peter gives us an answer. It's right here. Look at it. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. As some people think, no. He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Wow. Slow to anger. He wants everybody to repent. That is the desire of the Father's heart. 
It is why it's so important for you to not only be cheap with your grace that you've received, freely you have received, freely give it out. Tell somebody about your story. Tell somebody about your faith. Somebody needs to be saved just the way you were saved. He wants everybody to come to repentance. Have you ever done anything bad? Has your spouse ever done anything bad? All the women in the room say, amen. <laughs> amen. Just on the way over here, pastor. It's okay. Well, we got office hours, guys. We have office hours. Just on the way over here. I see some elbows going like this. You better not say amen. <laughs> Has your children ever acted crazy? I feel the eyes of my daughter just beaming on me. Listen, if God simply eradicated the bad in the world, not one of us would be here. Not one of us would be here. Because all of us are bad. Not one is good. That's why all of us in this room, we all need the grace of Jesus. Every single one of us in this room needs a Savior. All of us. Joel says, God is rich in faithful love. He has plenty to go around. His love never fails. The Lord's love is not simply love. It is faithful love. See, finally, Joel says, God relents from sending disaster. Oh, I love that. The Lord relents from sending disaster. He is holding it back. He's like, no, 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 no. I am ready for this. We're still in the, what's called the dispensation of grace, where you still have an opportunity to come to Jesus and repent of your sins and say, God, here I am. Do with me as you please. In other words, if one will return to God with a repentant, broken heart, God will be there with arms wide open. My friends, this morning, I want to remind you, this is why we can turn back to the Lord and return to him. He is not out to get you. He loves you. Those with problematic children have somewhat of an understanding about this, right? Your child might be the worst human on the planet, but not to your eyes. Oh, he's a good boy, though. <laughs> oh, ma'am, he done ripped the room apart. I know, but he's still a good boy. He bit me, but he's a good boy. He took my eye out. It's here, my hand. But he's a good boy. No matter how bad your child is, in your eyes... They could do no harm. Oh, no, not my precious angel. And that's normal. That's natural. They could be the worst human on the planet, yet if they came back to you with broken, repentant heart, guess what? You would be there for them. You would be there for them. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know all the answers. No matter what you've lived through, what you've done, what you've overcome, there is a place for you right here. Here, there is love for you in the arms of Jesus. When we wrap our minds and our hearts around God's gracious work in the gospel and root ourselves in Jesus, we find strength and power to change, church. Listen, because the power to change comes from who? From him and him alone. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in who? Christ Jesus. No other name but Christ Jesus. You see, when we surrender our lives and hearts to Jesus, we allow him to take control and do abundantly more than we can ever ask or imagine. And it is only when we surrender that hole in our hearts to Jesus will it finally be filled. When we surrender our hearts to Christ, we lose all our bragging rights. Come on, somebody. When we fully surrender our hearts to Jesus, we find the rest we have yearned for a very, very long time. I'm going to switch mics now if I can.
Whenever we surrender our hearts to Jesus, we lose nothing but gain everything. When we surrender our hearts to Jesus, we share in his glory with a renewed knowledge of God, a transformed way of thinking and behaving that begins to reflect God's purity, holiness, and spiritual wholeness. Only Jesus can give wholeness to a broken heart. Only Jesus can make you the kind of person you know you are ought to be. The sin that so easily entangles us is no match for the grace of Jesus. Paul quotes the prophet Hosea in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where he declares where O oh, death is your victory. Where O oh, death is your sting. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks God to God he has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ somebody ought to tell the devil this morning you can't touch this because I'm coming to Jesus and when you come to Jesus he begins to work in your heart and when Jesus works in your heart he'll work in your spouse he'll work in your children he'll work in your family when you come to Jesus with a broken and contrite heart God offers you mercy not only does he offer you mercy he offers you grace and not only does he offer you grace but he offers you every single blessing and every single promise that he declared in the word I'm here to tell somebody this morning that when you come to Jesus I'm telling you it doesn't mean every problem is going to disappear but this is what it means when you come to Jesus you don't got to sniff the cocaine anymore when you come to Jesus you don't gotta smoke the weed anymore when you come to Jesus you don't gotta drink the Bacardi anymore because I'm not I don't need it before I needed it I got depressed I sniffed it up I got down I smoked the weed I felt the pain on my past and on my trauma I tried to drink it away I woke up the next morning and the trauma was still there the pain was still there everything was still there but when I came to Jesus I oh something changed something changed when I came to Jesus the trauma was still there the pain was still there. The memories were still there. But what was different is I did not have a need to drink. I didn't have a need to sniff cocaine. I didn't have a need to smoke. Why? Because when Jesus gets a hold of your heart, everything changes. I got the problem. But I got Jesus. I got the trauma in my mind, but I got Jesus. And when I have Jesus, I have his word. And if I have his word, I got everything I need. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm telling you, church, Jesus is the answer. I don't care. You've been saved 25, 35, 45, 55 years. You still need Jesus. You still need the cross. You still need grace. You still need the blood of Jesus. The gospel is for everybody. Body, black, white, rich, poor. The gospel is for everybody. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Look, a minute, 30 seconds left. Hallelujah. The sound guys are, oh my God, this is a miracle. Pastor finished on time. Oh, I could be here all day. The Spirit of God is in this place right now. I said the Spirit of God is in this place right now. Somebody needs a miracle right now. Somebody needs a miracle. But listen, listen. Look what I've learned. The biggest miracle of all miracles is a repented heart. The greatest miracle of all is a contrite heart. Somebody who says, Father, I'm coming to you. I'm hurting. I'm broken. I've done some things that I'm not proud of. I'm coming to you. And the Father saying, you're coming to me. No, I'm coming to you. Because I see your heart. And you're coming with humility. 
You're coming broken. You're coming contrary. I'm coming to you. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Holy Spirit, right now, in the name of Jesus, bring conviction. Bring conviction of sin. I'm going to count to three. If you're here this morning, and you say, Pastor, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I really need Jesus in my life, man. I need to get my life together. Well, guess what? Jesus already did the work. There's nothing much you could do but just come with a repentant, contrite, broken heart. And let the Holy Spirit do the impossible. That's part of the problem. You've been trying to work out your own salvation. You can't earn salvation. It's a gift from God. So at the count of three, nobody looking. I want you to raise your hand high enough for me to see it. And then I want you to put it right back down. Ready? One, two, three. If that's you this morning, I want to see your hand just high enough for me to see it and then put it back down. Anybody that says, Pastor, I need a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is me today. Anyone. Anyone. So we take it that you're good. Now, now I'll be honest with you. You don't have to raise your hand to, to start a relationship with Jesus. There's, that's not a requirement. And if you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm just, it's just not me to be raising my hand. We respect that. But what we would like you to do to identify you and to follow up with you, if you decided in your heart to live for Jesus from this day forward, we would ask that you stop at the table that says first time here and let them know that you decided to follow Jesus today and fill out a card so that we can follow up with you and help you now as the worship team sings I need to pray yesterday as I was praying God put it in my heart for all the single mothers all the single mothers that are in the house. Single mothers. So I'm going to ask, as the worship team begins to sing, I'm going to ask all the single mothers to come forward because I need to pray for you. Something God put in my heart yesterday as I was praying. So I'm going to request all the single mothers come forward. 